Are people really paying thousands of dollars for original Mullard 12AU7s? I suppose I could imagine doing this if I owned a vacuum tube museum and wanted to complete a certain collection, but I hope that people aren't buying these and putting them in guitar amplifiers, hoping that their tone will improve. But that's not really what I want to talk about. What I really want to talk about is this circuit here. I am teaching my guitar amplification and effects class this semester, and I would like my students to be able to do lab assignments using vacuum tubes, but do so safely, so I thought I would look at some low-voltage circuits. I came across this electronics-diy website, and it has this schematic for a headphone amplifier. The main driver for the amplifier is actually a MOSFET, but it has a common cathode preamp stage. So I thought I would take a look at that. It has a 150 ohm cathode resistor and a pot here for the plate resistance. I just used this 4.7K resistor for the plate resistor, and I boosted the 100K here to 1 mega ohm. For the purposes of these simulations, I also took out the bypass capacitor, and I'm not bothering with the input capacitance. I found this Hosenlander website that has this triode common cathode amplitude calculator, and I put the various values in here, and I selected the 12AU7 model, and it computes a bunch of stuff for you. So let's see. It computed a bias current of 524 microamps, an anode voltage of around 9.5 amps, and a cathode voltage of around 78 millivolts. And let's see, it computed a small signal gain of 10, voltage amplification factor of 2.7. Huh, I'm not sure why this is different for the bypass and unbypass case, because I set the cathode capacitance to zero. Anyway, we'll call that close enough. And let's see what else. It thinks the internal plate resistance at that particular bias current is 13K. All right, so this website uses this super complicated Norman core model for vacuum tubes. It's not based on physics. It's a phenomenological fit of an equation to a bunch of curves. I'm going to guess that the triode model in Falstad is probably a lot simpler, so we shouldn't expect the results to match up exactly. The triode model consists of two parameters, mu and kg1. I pick these parameters from the values for mu and kg1 assumed by the Hosenlander calculator. So first, let me turn the peak-to-peak -peak voltage of the input waveform down to zero so we can figure out what it thinks the bias points are. Let's see. So these are definitely different. It looks like Falstad thinks the bias current is about half of what the Hosenlander website thinks it is is computing a bias voltage at the output at 10.7 volts versus 9.5, and it's computing a cathode voltage of 40 millivolts instead of 78 millivolts. So there's definitely differences in the models being used. Anyway, let me turn the peak-to-peak -peak voltage here up to 1 volt. Ah, we see that the waveform does distort on one side at the output. Let me change the peak-to-peak to, peak to 500 millivolts so we don't have any distortion. Okay, there we go. So we have a measured max and a measured min of, let's see, 11.9, 9.029. So let me subtract those numbers. 11.957 minus 9.029. That's the peak-to-peak -peak output. So let's divide that by my 500 millivolt peak-to-peak -peak input. So that gives us a large signal gain of around 5.8 something something. Now let's compute the theoretical small signal gain. So the intrinsic voltage gain of the tube mu is 21.5. And that's seen over a voltage divider of the plate resistance. So let me write 4.7. E3. And let's see, in the denominator of my voltage divider, I have that plate resistance. I also need the dynamic resistance of the tube, 
which this website said was 13.356K. So let me paste that in here, E3. Now there's another bit in here, which is the cathode resistance seen on the other side looking into the plate. And that's going to be 150 ohms, but I need to multiply that by mu plus 1. So that's 22.5. Let's see. And that gives me 4.7. So I guess we're in the ballpark, sort of. It should be noted that these tubes are really not intended to operate at plate voltages that low. If I take a look at the data sheet and look at this curve here, we could imagine trying to do a load line analysis. And let's see, the plate to cathode voltage here is 100. So here's 80, 60, 40, 20, and we're at 12 volts. So you would draw one point of your load line down here. And yeah, this is a bit crazy. So we're operating, let's see, here's, so here's two milliamps, four milliamps. So here's one milliamp. So half of that, 500 microamps is around here, <laughs> right? So we're really operating at the very edges of the chart here. So I wouldn't trust what's going on down here. And if we wanted to try to look up what the dynamic plate resistance RP is, let's see, here's one milliamp. So here's half a milliamp and there's not even any data here. Uh, you could probably take a guess. Let's see, so here's for plate to cathode voltages of 100 volts, 150 volts, 200 volts, and so on. So you could guess there's some line down here. So that, that 13K makes sense on this chart. But yeah, it's not here. It's not something you could read off the chart.